Good morning. Good to see everyone here. Thank you so much for being here with us. Taking the time on the first day of the week to come out and worship the one true living God. Thank you so much for being here and taking the time out of probably what's been a busy week to start off this week. To me, the best way that we can do it with family and worshiping God. This morning, Jeremy's going to be leading our singing. Tyler's going to have our Bible reading. He's going to be reading from Isaiah 2, 2 through 3. Ryan will have the first prayer. Uh, Matt's going to lead us in our Lord's Table Thoughts. And then at the close of the service, Greg is going to close us out uh, in prayer. So let's continue the beautiful singing and help out Jeremy. Let's all sing out this morning. We'll sing the first and the third. <clears throat> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. submission all is at rest I am my Savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with his goodness lost in his love this is my story this is my song This morning's Bible reading will come from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that he may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now we'll have our opening prayer. Before Ryan leads us in prayer, I'd like to go over the prayer list. Uh, Miss Sandra Williams is still in the hospital. Uh, let's continue to pray for her uh, to uh, show signs of improvement. Of course, uh, we continue to pray for Ronnie Mullinax and uh, his recovery and hope that he's able to come home soon. Miss Rhonda Smith, who's in the hospital going through the treatments, continue to pray for her. And, of course, Cody Pugh, who's in the hospital, of, uh, I think maybe coming home soon from his treatments, continue to pray for him. Um, the, uh, we've got several of our uh, youth that's going to exposure, and I uh, pray that good things come from that and their safety and safe to return. And I know this morning when I was listening to them, they're looking forward to uh, going to exposure. So let's pray that many good things come from that and the, their safe travels. Um, been told that Clint not feeling well, Daniel and Will's not feeling well, and of course Rocco's not feeling well. So we'll pray for them that they, they get better and they're able to get back with us. Uh, Miss Pauline's here with us this morning, uh, bruised but not broken. So it's so, so good to see that she's able to be back with us. Amber's back with us after her back surgery, so good to see her. And Jashana, after a, a little sickness, she's able to be back with us, and it's so good to see her. Let's all keep these names in mind, go through our church bulletin, read over those names and the families that are affected by sickness and disease and death, and keep them in our prayers. Let's go to God in prayer at this time.
you bow with me as we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We approach your throne of mercy and grace. We're humbled, dear Lord, that we have this opportunity to be in your presence. We're thankful that you love us. We're thankful that you hear our prayers. We're thankful that you loved us so much that you were willing to give your son. That Jesus was willing to die on the cross for our sins. That we may have your mercy and your grace through him. That we may have the opportunity to be reconciled, to be brought back to you through your covenant. We're thankful for that. We pray, dear Lord, as we spend this time this morning, this first day of the week that has been set aside for us to come and to worship you, that we do that in a way that is pleasing, that is in spirit, that is in truth, that our minds and our hearts are focused on your word, on your instructions and teachings that guides our lives, that we don't live just in the flesh today, but we live in the spirit each day as examples to those around us to guide those to the truth, the good news of salvation through Jesus. We ask our Lord as we go through this service, as we sing songs of praise to you, that we glorify you in that way, as we pray to you, that you, as you hear our prayers, dear Lord, that we are reverent to you, that we are respectful and loving to you, and we understand your great power. We pray, dear Lord, as we remember your son, that we take the Lord's Supper in a way that pleases you. And we ask, dear Lord, as we spend that time hearing your word proclaim that we have open hearts and minds that we can grow as Christians. And if there are those who are present this morning who are not your children, that your word will set on their heart, that will encourage them to understand the great love that you have for them. Heavenly Father, we are mindful of many of our congregation who have struggled with illnesses, who have been in and out of the hospital, who are battling diseases. And those we know who have recovered and who are with us, and we're thankful for that. We ask that you be with Will and Daniel, and Rocco and Sherry, and Clint. We pray that you continue to be with Ronnie and Rhonda, with Sister Ann and Sandra, and with Cody that's been mentioned this morning. We ask that you be with them in the circumstances that they are dealing with, with the illnesses and the battles that they face and their health. We pray that you continue to be with them, be with the ones who are administering to their health, and we pray to the Lord that. Uh, they can be back with us. Lord, we especially pray for Sister Sandra who's struggling in the hospital at this time that you would be with her and her doctors. Give her the strength and the will and her recovery, Lord, but let her know that we love her and that you love her. We pray that you'd be with those who will be attending the Exposure Youth Camp this week. As for safety for their travels, we ask that you would provide an opportunity for so many good lessons for them to hear that they would have open hearts and minds to hear your word that would strengthen them. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with our country. We ask that you'd be with those who are in critical roles uh, in our government, dear Lord. We pray for them. We pray that they would be willing to look at your word for guidance, dear Lord. But we know ultimately that we answer to you. But help us to understand the importance of our roles in, in, on this earth and, and as citizens of this country, dear Lord. And we pray that we always remember that our citizenship ultimately is in heaven. We ask, dear Lord, that you be with Joey this morning as he presents your word. We're thankful for his service to your kingdom, particularly at this congregation here at Parish and for his family. We ask you continue to bless him with understanding, with health, that he may continue to proclaim your word uh, throughout his life. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would go with us through the rest of this time we have to worship together this morning. Help that we pray that we do things that are pleasing to you. It's our prayer in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
put a lot of emphasis on a person's last words before they die. In some cases, a person's final thoughts summarize their life or their wishes for their family. Before taking the Lord's Supper this morning, let's look at two accounts of Christ's last words as he hung upon the cross. We read in the book of John, chapter 19, verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. What did Jesus mean when he said, it is finished? Well, there were a lot of things that finished at that point. There were a lot of prophecies fulfilled with the events of that day and his death. But it makes me think back to Luke chapter 2, verse 49, where we read about a young Jesus. He said, I must be about my father's business. From his time as a young boy, going about his father's business, and all the events throughout his life, the many miracles, the conversions, the teachings that he gave us, and now that work that he was committed to was finished. He had fulfilled his duty to the Father to be the sacrificial lamb. In Luke's account, we read in chapter 23, verse 46, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said that, he breathed his last. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He who had freely given himself to the, into the hands of his executioners was now committing himself into the hands of his father. In life, he had always submitted to his father's will, and now in death would be no different. The forsaken feeling that he had experienced shortly before no longer remained. So with this, he breathed his last, and Jesus uttered the words, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Words of complete faith, words that we need to remember this morning as we eat the bread and drink the cup that Jesus Christ fulfilled the prophecies. He endured the cross and he did all of it that we might have our sins forgiven. Would you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son Jesus. We thank you for his life and for his example and for his sacrifice for our sins. We ask that you might bless this bread that represents his broken body that hung upon the cross. We pray that those who partake of it will do so in a manner that is pleasing unto you. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. In like manner of the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this cup of the fruit of the vine that represents Christ's blood that was shed on the cross. We're humbled that your son would live this perfect life and offer himself as a sacrifice to save us from our sins. We pray now that we may drink this cup in a worthy manner. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We've set aside this time to give back as we've been commanded. If you haven't placed your contributions, you can as you leave the auditorium and the trays outside the exit doors. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for every blessing that you've given us. You always take care of our needs. And you give us more than we can give back to you. Help us now, Father, to give as we have prospered. Help us to do so with a cheerful heart. And we pray, Father, that our uh, offering this morning will be blessed that it may be used in ways that benefit your kingdom the most. For all these things we ask and give you our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus thy perfect likeness to wear. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art, come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness. 
Thank you for your presence this morning. Thank you for singing out. Thank you, Jeremy, for leading us uh, so well this morning in that singing. Uh, what a privilege it is to be the people of God, to be together as the people of God, and to worship Him uh, together with one another. I do have a special thank you note that Ms. Peggy wanted us to read this morning. I'll do that uh, quickly. I know that she's not the only one that feels this way, but special thanks, she says, to all who furnished the goodies for the fruit baskets uh, last Sunday, to the parents for taking the time to carry children caroling. And then to pass out the goodie bags as well. God bless each of you. I love everyone. Miss Peggy. We're thankful for Miss Peggy and thankful she's feeling better this week and, and here with us. And uh, continue to pray for her and so many others uh, in our number. We're going to be in Psalm number 48. Psalm number 48. If you want to be turning to that text, we'll get there in just a moment. Psalm number 48. It was a pilot who lived in Seattle. And he rented a plane from the Seattle airport. And he had kind of, kind of an off day, so he took his wife and his six-year-old daughter to the south to Tacoma, which is just across um, the, the, the uh, cove there, Puget Sound. Goodness. Puget Sound is right beneath Seattle. He flew across it to Tacoma. It's only about 20 miles, and it took about nine minutes. Daughter was just kind of getting used to this whole flying thing. She's six, and she gets off the plane. They go through the airport to go to the restaurant to eat lunch, and she looks up and says, Daddy, do they speak a different language here where we landed? Increasing in elevation, rising above, changes our perspective, doesn't it? She thought because they were high up, because they had traveled over the water, they must have traveled some far off place. We understand that there are significant things that happen when we rise above. We can track human history by means of increasing elevation. When it comes to building buildings, building heights have gotten higher and higher and higher throughout history. And we can track the, quote, progress of humanity through the increasing elevation of our buildings. Able to travel by way of air is a significant development. Da Vinci had those drawings for centuries before we were able to put anything into practice that would work. And since the early 1900s, we've been able to travel by way of air. And that has changed human history and interaction and productivity of mankind ever since. And then, of course, most recently, we've expanded to where we can not only fly anywhere on the earth, but we can fly above the earth, go into space, reach the heights of elevation, going above and beyond, putting man in space, putting man on the moon. Not only does that help with research, but now when we think about how connected we are via satellites. And one thing that's just fascinating to think about is we thought, what, 25, 30, 35 years ago, the Internet was an amazing thing as it was all these cables that connected computers together. But now, for the most part, all of that networking is done in the sky through satellites. We keep on rising above and we keep measuring human progress by the elevation the rising above to make that progress. But we need a healthy reminder here. Just as Genesis chapter 11 shows, 
the Tower of Babel. Going above is not always the humble thing before God. The more we find our success and the more we find our pursuits anchored to this earth, no matter quote, how high we get in those pursuits, no matter how much success we reach, the more we find ourselves ultimately being empty-handed. We need the constant reminder to pursue the higher way of living with God in the things of God. The answer to all of the drama and the uncertainty that this world presents is to always rise above it through God, and through his son, Jesus Christ. So this morning, we ask this question kind of one more time as we round out the year 2021 in our study largely from Colossians and anchored in Colossians chapter 3, the opening verse is there. Do we clearly understand that God is above all the things of the earth? And when we do understand that truth, do we know how to keep on going to him and finding him there? And of what value is that to us? As we consider Psalm 48 this morning, a little bit of background first. It's one of three consecutive psalms. It's the third consecutive psalm that emphasizes the city Jerusalem. Psalm 46, which we're extremely familiar with. Psalm 47, now Psalm 48. All picture the city of Jerusalem and its elevation and its majesty. But not just for picturing the city itself. They emphasize Jerusalem for the purpose of emphasizing God. And emphasizing how God protects and provides for the city, and especially the people of the city. Jerusalem sits some 2,500 feet above sea level. That's fascinating because it's some 50 miles away from the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. So for a little perspective, Mount Chiha, highest point in our state of Alabama, 2,400 feet above sea level. But it's about 300 miles from the coast. So if you were to drive from the Florida coast or from Gulf Shores or Orange Beach to Mount Chiha, it would take you a while to slowly increase that elevation. But when you're there where Jerusalem's at, it's a quick, steep incline to get to the city on its perch because it is so close to the sea, to the Mediterranean Sea. From every direction, Jerusalem is imposing. It's imposing to the visual sight, and it's imposing because it demands constant, strenuous activity to climb higher and higher to get to it. When you think about the gospel narratives, read and how often you see the phrase, they went up to Jerusalem. Even when they're traveling south, the text will say they went up to Jerusalem because it is an elevated city. So think about what a Jew would have heard in the first century when Jesus said, as we read last week from Matthew 5, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. What the Jews understood, even in the time of the Psalms here, is that to recognize the beauty of the city was to also recognize the beauty of God who had given them the city, who had chosen the land, chosen the people to live in the land. So this morning we want to look at this psalm, not just because it's about Jerusalem or about this elevated thought, but because it brings us nearer to God, the God who himself is the God above. So let's read together beginning in verse number one, we'll read verses one through three. Great, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the holy city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king, within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. First aspect we notice from these verses is that God is the one who is above. When we describe God, we describe him as being above. The first thing he says actually is God is great. Great is the Lord. We opened the very beginning of this year, the first week of a study from the Psalms about the proper mindset. And that begins with knowing who God is and knowing what God is and what God does because of who he is. God is thinking is the healthy practice of the spiritual mature. How often do we think and dwell on and get lost in and meditate upon what God is? Here they recognize God is great. You ever thought about trying to define what great means? It's kind of tied to this idea of elevation. What's, what's great? It's such a common word and a, a base word, we might say. We don't really struggle kind of to d define what is great. But it means it's unusually large or unusually significant 
or perhaps it's comparatively significant, comparatively large. When you talk about greatness, you're automatically talking about the upper levels because whatever category it is, you're saying this is near or at the top. Certainly that's true when it comes to the greatness of God. When it comes to any category, God is always the best and the greatest. Psalm 86 and verse 10, you are great and you do wondrous things. Psalm 145 verse 3, his greatness is unsearchable. Think about that for a moment. His greatness is unsearchable. There's no limit to his greatness. I can't find the ceiling. I can't find the floor. I can't find the entrance or the exit. It's always around. It's always available. Children of Israel, when they come through the Red Sea, God has delivered them safely from the capture of the Egyptians. And it says they recognized and they saw the great power of God and they believed. Anything God is, he is the greatest. And anything God does, he does it as the greatest. So when you notice verse 1, they praise God. This praise of verse 1 is echoed in verse 14. That might be a kind of a common thing in our Western culture to begin and end in the same way, but it's not always something that the Hebrews do. I guess it is somewhat common in, in some ways. But here it's clear what he's doing. He's saying of all this talk about the city and, and even some of the things that God does about the city, you need to know this first. God is great. He is Lord. And he is Lord forever and ever when you see verse 14. He's intentionally drawing our focus into seeing the lens by which we need to see the entire psalm. Cannot escape God who is great and who is above. Then he moves, verse number one, in the city of our God. And then again, verse two, the city of the great king. This is God's city. To recognize the city, that it's high and lifted up, its elevation, its majesty, forces us to look beyond it and see the God who's behind it. They couldn't look at the city and think, we did this on our own, or they shouldn't have. They could look at the city and see, this is God who's given us this great place. Verse 2, listen to what it says. Not only is the city the joy of the Jews, it's the joy of all the earth. Think about how differently we now read that statement compared to how the Jews would have in that time. We know that it's through God's plans that the whole earth has come to know the gospel. At that time, this was where the God of heaven chose to live among his people. It was the joy of the earth in a different way, but now we have the fullness of that blessing. Verse number three, God has made himself known as a fortress within her citadels. Don't miss how important it is that God makes himself known. Everything we know about God, we know because he has given it to us, because he wants us to know him. And so it's through these walls of this city that he is revealing himself. Psalm 76 opens by saying God is known in Judah. In Judah, God is known. His abode has been established. His dwelling place is in Zion. So this verse 3 makes it clear. Here's why the city is great. It's because God makes it so great. So what we need to see here is the elevation of the city points to an even greater elevation, a glorification, the lifting up of God himself. But as we turn our attention to now, to the New Testament era, we need to see something even more important, even greater that we get to experience and enjoy. In Psalm number two, a messianic psalm about Jesus, God says about Jesus, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. The kings are going to come against God and God looks down and laughs at them in derision. But he says, as for me, my king, my king will reign, quote, out of Zion. Isaiah two that we read for our scripture reading this morning. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. It shall be lifted up above the hills. All the nations shall flow to it. You see that same language from the opening verses of Psalm 48. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. What Isaiah was talking about there. What the Lord is wanting us to know here is that it's not the physical Jerusalem that now counts today. What happened on Pentecost in Acts 2 began the era through which we can now access God through Jesus Christ from anywhere. And so we are participants in an even greater Jerusalem, as it were. 
It's where Hebrews 12 lands. We don't go through Zion, we go th or through Sinai, we go through Zion. So now we get this realization that when the word sounded forth in Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem, now is the opportunity for all of mankind to come to God through Christ. What mankind, especially the Jews, thought they wanted geographically, God has established spiritually in Christ and his church. So now that we have this promise, we get to assemble together. We get to approach him in his glory. We want to recognize and honor the God who is above. Then we do so through his son and through his church. Ephesians chapter 2, we're called fellow citizens with the saints. We're members of the household of God. And it's through Christ, verse 21, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Where do we find God today? Living among his people. We as the church are now his temple. Through Jerusalem where the gospel was preached and now as the spiritual temple of his people. We get to see and know God who is above. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. You yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We're being built upward more and more as we grow into the likeness of Christ and as we serve as priests in the temple, the church of God. So what a blessing today to know we get to experience this on an even greater level. The God who is above has given us a temple, his church, his gospel. But notice verse 3, he has made himself known as a fortress, that begs the question, when has he made himself known? How has he made himself known as a fortress? Well, the psalmist addresses that beginning of verse 4. For behold, the kings assembled. They came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there. Anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind, you shattered the ships of Tarshish. I can't help but notice the contrast of these kings, beginning in verse 4. They assemble. They come together. They respond emotionally to the presence of God. Now, from a, a political aspect, socio-political perspective, it makes sense that a city elevated like this, a city with the great success that Jerusalem had had, it would be a prime target. Well, if we can establish our stronghold in Jerusalem, then that will increase our kingdom. You can see why they would be attacked by people regularly. But also notice this, they're coming against God when they do so. God is so great in his greatness that we all choose to respond to him in one direction or the other. Either we respond to his greatness in humility and submission and righteousness, or we respond by coming against him as they did in rebellion and attacking him. But notice what happens. Verse 5 gets a lot of emphasis, commentaries, and so forth. When they assemble, there's these four verbs. They saw it. They were astounded. They were in panic. They took the flight. They left. And people say this sounds a lot like, though it happened clearly before Julius Caesar ever said this, it sounds a lot like when Julius Caesar said, I came, I saw, I conquered. Except for when they came against God, they failed. They came, they saw the city, they saw God's majesty, and they did not conquer. They were defeated. There's a lot of key words here that really bring this to light at how thorough God's destruction is and thus how great his protection is of his own people. The word for astounded here in verse 5 has to do with being caught off guard. It's a sudden threat, something that was unexpected. Sometimes it's, it's, it almost has a positive meaning, a reverent fear of amazement. But oftentimes, as is the case with them, it's a fear of despair, of dread. Job would use the word that's astounded here. He would use it in Job 26, and verse 11, to say the pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. He speaks and the pillars of heaven shake. So they saw what they were up against. They were overcome with this overwhelming sense of dread. So they were panicked and they took to flight. They left. Notice verse 6, there's this word picture. Trembling took hold of them there, anguish as if or as of a woman in labor, a woman giving birth. There's this helplessness. They could not avoid it. It's impending. It's oncoming. 
and thinking about the pain that women endure, especially without our modern day anesthesia of that natural childbirth. It's imminent and they writhe around in that pain. They can't stop it. There's helplessness. That's the dread they felt. We can see that we're up against a foe that's too mighty for us, but they cannot do anything about it any longer. And then verse 7, there's another word picture here. By the east wind, you shattered the ships of Tarshish. We know Tarshish from the Jonah story. It was the farthest west port that you could get to of, the, of that time. And so think about this. Ships that went to as far as you could go had to be the sturdiest, mightiest ships of the day. And they say, God, you shatter and break apart the very ships that the world looks up to as the most sturdy and the greatest of ships. So here the emphasis is just the overwhelming nature of God's victory over them. Take the threatening, most threatening, imposing forces of that day, and God shatters them before them. This section reminds us that the kingdoms of men rise and fall, but it's a part of God's everlasting love that he sees and he protects his people amongst the earthly kingdoms when they come against us. We need the reminder that God has always proven himself to protect us and defend us even from above. He has given us the ultimate victory in sin, over sin, and over death, meaning that any other threat pales in comparison. Paul would say, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, specifically there, over sin and death. Thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. And it's because he has given us that victory, and it's a constant victory, that he also gives us confidence to overcome any false teaching or false thinking threat that might come our way. That's been our point of emphasis throughout the year to say, you know, look at, look at Colossians to see how they had all these swirling false things. And Paul keeps going back to saying, Christ is where you must be. And he answers everything that comes your way. And it's because of that ultimate victory that we now have the capability of overcoming anything that would cause us to doubt or would turn against us and try to cancel us, as it were. So listen with that seed planted. Listen to what Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So today's cultural forces are loud. They're relentless, but they are not victorious and they will never be victorious. No matter how secular, no matter how self-driven and self-oriented, no matter how sexually confused, no matter how emotionally struggling, those cultural forces do not possess any power to overcome the truth of God and the victory of God through Christ. We must be sure that the God, to see that the God who destroyed the enemies of this psalm in Psalm 48 also now gives us the power through Christ to equip us through victory to live in a difficult era, to do so with both truth and love. He has given us and continues to give us everything we need to respond to present cultural challenges. We find it in Christ and we find it in his word. But number three, look back at Psalm 48, look at verse eight. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go around her. Number her towers. Consider well her ramparts. Go through her citadels that you may tell the next generation that this is God. Our God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. So here he closes with something that's fascinating. He points us to think about, points how they think about the steadfast love of God. Through this act of deliverance, they can see what they've been hearing about the steadfast love of God. The old preacher Charles Spurgeon said, where God is best seen and known, he is most loved. They know God's great. 
They experience the threat. Now they see firsthand God's deliverance. And so they think about, they dwell on his steadfast love. That means they continue to grow more and more in their love for him. What they're saying is what we have heard about and learned about in the past, we now keep seeing in, our, in the future. He has acted on our behalf in our present time. Steadfast love in verse 9 is one of the main words of the Old Testament. You go through the New Testament, we think about the importance of a word like agape. Well, steadfast love, or kesed, is that word in the Old Testament. It's tied to covenant, covenant loyalty, seen in active kindness. So really the King James Version that uses uh, loving kindness is the main word here. That's probably the most accurate. It's not just feeling, it's not just affection or compassion, but it's seen in action and in kindness, and it's because of the covenant God has extended. Psalm 26 and verse 3, your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. We respond to and turn to a God who we recognize is always loving and always loving to us, and is always faithful to us. But then notice verse 8 of Psalm 48. He is the Lord of hosts, and the city of the Lord of hosts, and the city of our God. Think about how both of those descriptors are powerful together. Because he is the Lord of the multitudes. Typically when we see the Lord of hosts, we typically think of the angelic multitudes, the angelic armies. So he is the Lord who controls all the great, mighty, angelic warriors. But so too he is our God. The victory he has provided on grand scales, he also lends the power to each of us, no matter how small we feel no matter how small we think we may be. Just as God has secured Jerusalem, he, so too he secures us. But then verse 10, since his name automatically reaches to the ends of the earth because his name is already great, so too we should desire that our praise for him reaches the ends of the earth as well. Think about that again, like we did in verse 2. How that phrase, the ends of the earth, takes on so much greater meaning now in the days of the new covenant, the gospel. Since Pentecost of Acts 2, since Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, now it's true that every single soul on earth, no matter where we dwell, can know God, praise God and his name. Also, verse 10 talks about there, his right hand is filled with righteousness. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Spurgeon again said that every person who comes to God understands he is not a God of an empty hand. Those who come against him know that in his hand is righteous judgment. But those who come with humility before him understand he has righteous protection, righteous concern for them always. Verse 11 says the proper response is to be glad and to praise. We should take that as a reminder that when we see who God is, what should always result is joy gladness, and outward praise. But I especially love what happens in verse 12. Verse 12, you see, there's this invitation. Walk about. Like, he's a command. It's an imperative. Walk about Zion. Go around her. Number her towers. Consider well her ramparts. Go through her citadels. There's this command to scan and survey the city. Think about that for a moment. A city who's just been delivered. A city who is at times under attack. Now, the threat is gone. It's safe enough to where the psalmist says, get out and go look at the city. And when you do, you're going to see how much God loves you based on how much he has spared you. And so you see this imagery of walking about to scan the towers, to scan the ramparts and the citadels to see exactly what God has provided in giving us or giving them escape. The word for towers there has the root of great, actually. It's the greatest, highest of buildings within the city, the towers that can overlook everything. But then also you see the word for ramparts or bulwarks. They're the outer defense walls. Think about this for a moment. If you go and you survey and you scan the outer defense walls and they're not damaged, they're not destroyed, what does that say about those who are on the inside? See, the threat never made it inside because the outer walls are not even damaged. Same is true for the word citadel. Citadels is likely these houses, these station points for guards and soldiers. It's through them that you would likely have the entrances and the exits. It says go through her citadels. 
Again, if they are not destroyed, if they are intact, if they have survived, that means the threat never made it to the city. And so to scan the city and to survey it is to look at God and his power and how he has used that power out of his steadfast love to protect his own people. For what purpose? Notice the text says, for the purpose of telling the coming generations that God is the God who protects and that God is the God who protects through his presence. See, first the action, the action spreads from the person to the city. Yes, God is the God of the city, but look at the city and scan it and see just how great he is. But then he says, beyond that, it needs to spread generationally. Look around, see the evidence of God's love for you and remember it so vividly that you will tell it and retell it to your own children. Where had they heard of God's love before that they now see in action? Same idea keeps happening. Here's what we saw. Here's what we know about God. A constant eye on the next generation to be able to tell them and show them this is how great God is. But then verse 14, not only is God present, not only is God their protector of that day, but he will sustain them and guide them into the future. One of the words there for forever in verse 14 has to deal with death, even until death. He guides us all the way forever. So thankfully, through Christ today, we have these same promises. We get even more to seek God when we seek him above. We know from Acts chapter 17, he has designed this world and us to live in this world so that we should seek him and perhaps feel our way toward him and find him. Yet he is not actually very far from each of us. See, he's this mighty, great God, powerful God who's created us, but he is also near us. And thus he wants us to seek him and to know him more and more. In Romans, there's a bit of a thread about seeking. What are we going to seek the most? Where will it lead us? Is it about self? Is it about the things of this earth? Or is it about him? In the section that's dealing with the Jews and how they've departed God, Romans chapter 2, beginning of verse 6, he will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. For those who are in Christ, Romans chapter 8, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The difference is all about what we seek. We seek his will. We seek his son. Seek his church. Seek his word in all things. We scan it, survey it continually, and seeing evidence over and over of what God is and who God is, and thus what he also expects from us. The Jews failed to do that. Chapter 10 in Paul's a condemnation of them. Talks about this seeking idea again. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. They have the desire. They have the emotion, the intensity about God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So the alternate reality psalm for these Jews of the first century would be, look at this great deliverance we had. And they would walk out and they would look at the city and say, well, see, look how great a piece of land we picked for ourselves. Look at how great and tall the towers we built. Look at how great our outer walls that we built were. Look at how great our citadels were, the men that we hosted and put in those citadels. That's why we're safe. They were told, go scan the city. And see it as proof and evidence of God's continual steadfast love. It's not establishing your own name. Not establishing your own will. Romans 10 there, we just read, reminds us that to truly seek God, to truly get above the things of this world, is to first and only seek Christ. To seek Christ, to seek his church. That's true doctrinally, that's true theologically on a grand scale, but it's also true practically Every single day. What do I seek? Who do I seek? 
or what I seek most? What do we do during such a tense, divided era of time? Seek God. Seek Christ. Seek his church. What do we do during such a twisted, undefinable, immoral generation? We seek God. We seek Christ. We seek his church. This morning as we close and as we kind of put a bow on this year of study, we remind ourselves one more time of Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. As we read, notice that each of us are here somewhere. Where, where will we be? Are we doing the things that we're supposed to do? Are we seeking the things we're supposed to seek? He says there, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above and not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So where do we find ourselves in this passage? Have we been raised with Christ? Have you been raised with Christ in baptism? Can you say, as verse 3 says, that you have died, died to sin and died to self, and your life is daily hidden with Christ and God? If you cannot say that, let today be the day you choose to be raised with him. Confess your belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Decide and declare once and for all to turn away from the sin of self. Put him on in baptism. Be immersed there for the forgiveness of your sins. What if you are a Christian this morning? Are you seeking the things that are above where Christ is? Not just better things, but actually the things that are above where Christ is. What about your mind? Your mind set on the things that are above, not the things of the earth. What about verse 4? Can you honestly say, can we honestly say, Christ is my life? The challenge with saying that is we only have one life. If there are other things that are our lives, if there are other people who are our lives, we're now saying we don't have room for Christ to be our life. And then finally, the close of verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. How strongly do you anticipate his final return? If he comes today, if Jesus Christ returns for his faithful today before this invitation song is over, before we make it home, before we make it to the restaurant, we look back on today as the greatest day, the day in which we get to meet our Savior who is above, who is coming for us. He longs for us to live for him above now so that we get to live with him above for eternity. If you have any need, please come now as we sing together.